This morning, our story comes to us from Song of Songs 7, 6 through 13. How fair and pleasant you are, O loved one, delectable maiden. You are stately as a palm tree, and your breasts are like its clusters. I say I will climb the palm tree and lay hold of its branches. O oh, may your breasts be like clusters of the vine, and the scent of your breath like apples, and your kisses like the best wine that goes down smoothly, gliding over lips and teeth. I am my beloved's, and his de desire is for me. Come, my beloved. Let us go forth into the fields and lodge in the villages. Let us go out early in the vineyards and see whether the vines have budded, whether the grape blossoms have opened and the pomegranates are in bloom. There I will give you my love. The mandrakes give forth fragrance, and over our doors are all choice fruits, new as well as old, which I have laid up for you, O oh, my beloved. Good morning. It is great to be here today. Um, today, we get a fun service, erotic theology. Have you ever heard a <laughs> service about that? Pretty strange sounding. What's in store? Let's see. Uh, before I get into that, though, I just want to um, actually take a quick moment uh, and actually make an apology. Um, uh, something I said last service, um, a few people came up to me and shared about it. Um, I, I used a word that I picked up in middle school um, that... Um, it's the word lame, and I use it in kind of a context of like, that's not cool. So that word, um, like, that's lame. And uh, I hadn't thought about the way that that's an ableist term. Um, that's, that's a, it's a word that's been used, you know, to describe disabled people, and uh, has been kind of to connect that with something that's not socially good is, is a problem in our vocabulary. And I just want to kind of apologize for that, confess that, um, and thank the folks who shared that with me. Um, I'm thankful that this is a community where we can call each other in, call each other out, um, in love and grace, and um, where we can apologize and hopefully um, be forgiven. So uh, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, hopefully we can all learn uh, and grow with our vocabularies. Um, so speaking of other things I learned in middle school, uh, <laughs> sex and sexuality, what we're talking about today. Um, in seventh or eighth grade, I don't remember when it was, um, I, I had this thought, I have to get a girlfriend. All of my friends had girlfriends. Actually, like, less than half of my friends had girlfriends. But in my head, everybody in the world had a boyfriend or a girlfriend except for me. And that meant I was ugly and undesirable and, and, and just um, an awful person. Um, and my body was horrible. And I would never get one. Um, so I, I get this idea in my mind, I got to get a girlfriend. So how do I get a girlfriend? Okay, step one, find a girl. Uh, luckily, in my homeroom, uh, I was co-ed school, and there was a girl who sat next to me in homeroom. And homeroom is like this pointless class where you just spend 20 minutes, and there's announcements and Pledge of Allegiance. I don't know what homeroom is for. Sorry, teachers, if, that's, if I'm getting this wrong. Uh, I didn't understand it. But there was time to talk in homeroom. So uh, there was a girl sitting right next to me, and I was like, okay. There she is. Uh, step two, how do I connect and communicate with her? Um, I didn't have any capacity to like have a conversation with her. Um, so I had seen a lot of movies, and I knew if you buy somebody something, they like you. So uh, I went to the local gift shop, and I walked past the jewelry, and I walked past the scented candles, straight to the Beanie Babies. And I uh, picked out this awesome dog with these big googly eyes and this tag. And this was before Beanie Babies were a big fad. It was like, this is so cool. Uh, he's going to love it. And she did. She, like, totally bought it. Uh, and it was, there wasn't even a good holiday nearby. I was like, this is a Halloween present. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard of that. I was like, well, you know, that's the thing where I come from. Um, Halloween present. I gave her this Beanie Baby. And then later that day in the hallway, I was like, do you want to be my girlfriend? And she didn't hear me the first time. So I had to do it again. It was like torture. It's like, do you want to be my girlfriend? And she's like, OK. And the clouds lifted, and my insecurities departed. And I've never been insecure again. So <laughs> <sighs> what, what a great solution. Um, the insecurity of the pu pubescent teenager is an abyss. 
And yet, how many of us still have these deep-seated fears about ourselves and our body and our sexuality? Um, it is something that we do not shake off easily. How much of our sexuality is still wrapped up in proving something? Because that, that's what that was. I, I wanted to prove that I was likable, that I was desirable, that I was special, that I was cool um, to myself and, and to those around me. So much of modern sexual imagery and identity is about masking our insecurities through conquest, through being noticed, through um, getting attention, through being amazing in bed, as though being amazing in bed is like learning the right tricks uh, and some gymnastics thing rather than the connection and the flow of energy between people. I think the modern, shallow, mainstream kind of sexuality like this is rooted in this deep-seated insecurity and a bottomless lack of self-regard and heavy, overlaid shame. In fact, the very first story of humans in the Bible is about this kind of shame. It's, you know, everybody's heard the story of Adam and Eve, and there's the apple in the garden, and so God says, don't eat the apple, and they go ahead and they eat the apple. Um, and for many years, this has been interpreted by at least the main loudest voices, which all tend to be men, um, as the, the, the original sin, the first thing that humans did wrong was pride and disobedience, that they thought they were better than God and the better than the rules and they disobeyed and that is the core human condition that we are prideful and disobedient creatures and yet there have been mystics since the beginning of when the story is written and women in particular since the beginning of the story is written and and uh, with feminist and womanist scholarship this is in Mujerista scholarship um, this is a growing uh, awakening that this has been part of the tradition. There's another way to read this story, that the story of Adam and Eve and, and eating the apple um, isn't about disobedience in pride, but that the voice of the snake, um, so God has made these creatures, and they're wonderfully, and they're beautifully made, and they're blessed with these gifts and this power and, and all of this, and they can pretty much do whatever they want to, um, but the snake says, actually, you are lacking. Actually, there is something wrong with the way you were made. You should be ashamed. You are not good enough. You're not smart enough. You don't know enough. You're not going to live long enough. There's something broken inside of you. And so they feel this, and, and they want to fill that gap in something that's already okay. And so they shame and distrust of the goodness of the Creator that has been given to them, that distrust is the beginning of this process of injustice and sin and, and failure and, and frustration and hatred and violence and all of these things, that it's shame rather than pride that might be that core thing inside us that drives us to do things that are harmful to ourselves and to others. Are you all tracking this at all? Is this making sense? I mean, when I first heard this, was, this, is, this is such a reframing of this Story. Yes, there are some people who are narcissists and who really need to kind of have that pride thing, that disobedience thing wrapped in. But for most people, shame is that motivating fear that there is something defective, that God messed up when you were made, that there's something uniquely wrong about you and you don't trust that you were fearfully and wonderfully made. Yet in a cruel twist, the church, that, which kind of tells this story, has become in many ways mainstream like the voice of the snake, telling people that there is something defective about them and their bodies and their sexuality, their desires. Um, in fact, there's this guy, uh, John Piper, um, this fundamentalist writer. He's got a huge following, and, and he, last week there's kind of a firestorm. He was responding to a, a letter that one of his readers wrote, a woman who says, I hate my body. Every day I, I think about how much I hate my body. You know, I, I'm trying to stop. Can you help me? And his response is, that he says, you should stop asking, you should stop telling yourself, stop hating your body. Instead, you should ask yourself, am I hating my body for the right reasons? I mean, a twisted, cruel, because your body tempts you to sin, so you should hate it. He's encouraging her to hate her body. Um, this is the kind of the monstrous effects of, of what this has done. And as somebody who, who's lost a, a sister um, to... Uh, suicide because of disordered eating wrapped up in body image and, and hatred of, of, of body and self and sexuality. Um, this kind of thing 
runs deep and it is more than theory it's more than abstract theology this is about life and death this is about people living and flourishing and being free versus being caged by the society and the messages that we hear um, and that we internalize this uh church teaching that um that the body is bad and wicked and cannot be trusted that matter um, is something awful um, whereas the spiritual things, the rational things are good, is, is deep within our culture. In fact, St. Augustine, um, who's, who had a lot of good ideas, had some pretty bad ideas too, he located the original sin, the transfer of kind of brokenness in people in the moment of orgasm. You kind of have to really read through the lines to, to see it, but he, that's, that's what he says, um, that when people orgasm in order to have conception, that's when original sin is passed, because an orgasm is when you are least rational, um, and rationality is like God, which is okay. Um, and irrationality is like animalistic and bad and wicked, um, cause that's when, when you're not in control of this wicked thing, uh, your body. And that has been passed down and down and down and is hard to unravel. Um, churches typically have two ways they approach sex. They either talk, talk kind of hardcore about how bad it is, and so you have to really, really control it in this very narrow box, um, which has tended to be like cisgendered, hetero, um, you know, all this kind of stuff. And, uh, uh, or they're silent about it. And it's just kind of like, well, sex is not a spiritual thing. It has nothing to do with, with spirituality, so let's just not talk about it. The church that I got into in high school was pretty much silent about it. It was one of those. And yet, as a teenager, you pick it up somewhere. So I went to this one church camp where we spent three days at this thing, and it was, it was not my church's thing, it was somebody else's thing, and uh, the, the preacher gave all these sermons, like multiple sermons a day for three days, and they were all about how bad our bodies were, and how everything that we thought and felt, and it was all teenagers, and so me and everybody else in that room ended the week like, I'm going straight to hell. Like, I am a bad, bad person because of all these thoughts and feelings I have. Um, it had a huge effect on me, creating a lot of shame and kind of self-disgust. And, and, and yet other folks were dosed with this in much higher levels. Um, it's amazing that, you know, that preacher, I do remember him saying kind of at the end, but if you wait till you're married, then it'll be awesome and it'll be, everything will be great and perfect. Um, you'll have amazing sex the night of your wedding and it's going to be great. Um, and yet so many people I know who've tried to follow the rules end up carrying with them uh, a lot of shame around their sexuality, even when they are married. And they're just following all the rules, and yet they still feel like they're doing something bad, and it's a secret, and they should be hiding it. Um, because it is rooted uh, not in the rules, but in this deep idea that our bodies and our sexuality are somehow twisted and wrong to be afraid of, to be masked, to be hid. And so if we're calling people out of that kind of fear of, of the body and, and sexuality, the question is, emerging out of that concept of sexuality is bad, into what? I mean, the alternative seems to be kind of our pop culture idea of sex and sexuality, which is um, sex is basically meaningless. Uh, I got a haircut um, the other day, um, and by the other day, I mean four months ago. Uh, <laughs> I get about once a year, so that seems recent. Um, I got his haircut, and I really liked it. And I was talking to my stylist, and I'm like, this is so great. You know, maybe I should come here more often, but I don't like the money. I don't spend the money. And then products, and what should I get, and blah, 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 blah. It's my vanity side I'm sharing with you. Um, and uh, just going on and on about this. And then at the end, she just looked at me and said, dude, it's just a haircut. <laughs> Which is kind of strange. I mean, that's her business, but um, not a good salesperson. Uh, <laughs> but, dude, it's just a haircut. Like... And don't stress about it. I mean, our whole conversation, we'd had like, an, like a 30-minute conversation about like meaningful life and work and justice and everything because she asked me what I'd do and we got off on this tangent. Um, so maybe that's what she was thinking. But basically, that's like the mainstream version of what sex is. It's just a haircut. It's just sex. Whatever. It's no big deal. And yet, if it's no big deal, how come our sexuality is something that is so often tender Something that, when violated, can cause incredible trauma and heartbreak um, that is deep-seated. It's not just a haircut. A sexual violation is not the same as having your car stolen. It is something deep and core within us. And I think it's because our sexuality is deeply connected to our spirituality. Last week, we talked about the kind of different views of, of matter and spirit, and we kind of had these different motions. Matter is like the bodies and the stuff of the world, and spirit is like 
you know, the spirit, it's non-bodied things and, and how there's different worldviews. And, and the mainstream view in much of the church has been that spirit is superior to matter and you want to elevate the spirit and kind of that Augustine thing, like be rational. He even said that it's okay to have sex if there's no desire involved. Man, sorry for his partner. I don't know. Um, no desire. You have sex with that. Like a mechanical sex is, I guess, what he's promoting. Um, but spirit is superior to matter. You want to destroy, you want to crush the, the feelings of the body, but elevate um, the spirit. And then the kind of the mainstream pop culture sort of more scientific view is that spirit is, is an illusion. That's just kind of superstition stuff. All that matters is, is, is the body. Um, and so basically it's like a piece of meat kind of sex. But mystical Christianity, we, we find an alternative view to spirit and matter. Not that spirit is superior to matter, not that spirit doesn't exist, not that matter is superior to spirit, but that the two things are intertwined, deeply, deeply intertwined and connected. That spirit is at the core of matter, that you cannot separate the two. That this is the idea of Christ, the incarnation, the great symbol of a universal reality, that God is at home in the world, in your bodies, in the stuff, in the earth, in everything around us, is animated by the spirit of God. That everything is sacred, that our bodies are sacred, our sexuality is sacred, the earth is sacred. That we belong in our skin and on this planet and in this universe. I feel like, if you want to fill in the blank, fill in the blank here. Um, blank is about connection, passion, mystery, growth, intimacy, discovery, risk, bodies, spirits, experimentation, forgiveness, creativity, transcendence, and joy. Sex, sexuality, spirit, spirituality. I mean, both, to me, fit exactly in that thing. Spirituality and sexuality are about so many of the same things. Connection, passion, mystery, growth, intimacy, discovery, risk, body, spirits, experimentation, forgiveness, creativity, transcendence, and joy. Our sexuality is spiritual. Our sexuality is good. If you get nothing else out of this today, I hope you can hear somebody at one point say, sexuality, your sexuality is good. Song of Songs is this book that we read from. This is an erotic love poem in the middle of the Bible that has been, you know, somehow missed for a while. Um, it is an erotic love poem. There's kind of no ways around it. If you, if you heard the scripture, we should have read that a few more times. It is saucy. It is saucy. I want to climb your tree, and I want to taste your kisses. And it's, it's very sensual. It's about the, the, your breath is like the scent of apples and your kisses go down like wine. It's about taste and touch and smell. Um, uh, the, the woman talks about, I'm going to set out the mandrakes. Those were an aphrodisiac. This is an erotic love poem in the middle of the Bible. Sexuality is spiritual. Yet over time, Christianity and Judaism both came to regard this poem as not about um, love between people and desire between people, but between um, God and Israel in the case of uh, the Jewish tradition, or between Christ and the church in the case of the Christian tradition. And although, you know, you could look at it as an obvious ploy to sort of desexualize these texts, and I'm sure that was part of it, but the question is, why did it work? How, how, did, how did anybody buy into that? Um, and I think the answer uh, at least the, the thing that works for me is because people who've had an encounter with mystery and transcendence in God um, can actually relate to that, that there is desire, there is wonder, there is mystery, there is an embodied experience of God that is kind of like that sexual experience. There is a desire. Um, the, the word erotic that's in our kind of theme for today um, comes from the Greek word eros, which is translated as love but it's love that comes from desire, from yearning for something, for wanting something. And it doesn't have to be bad. It can be glorious, good, spiritual, and holy. We all seek meaning and depth. We all seek connection and erotic connection. It's not just about the genitals, by the way. Um, I've learned this recently, that people, um, many people who are paralyzed um, actually end up developing new erogenous zones in parts of their body uh, that they didn't have it before, so they can experience sexual connection. That's the power of the great sex organ, which is the brain. 
that we have this desire to connect, to experience pleasure, to experience a flow of energy between people. And I think at a mature level, sex is not primarily about biological drive. It's a form of creative and spiritual communication, a space for profound intimacy. But we, we think of intimacy often as kind of like merging into one person, having the exact same experience at the same time and like being one um, about everything. When intimacy is about actually, uh, psychologically speaking, being able to um, have closeness with another person and listen and hear and be with them while holding on to yourself and who you are being rooted enough that you don't get caught up in whatever everybody else is doing and trying to please them or trying to merge with them or trying to get yourselves on the same page. It's like when, uh, you know, your spouse or just somebody in your household, you're somebody in your family, they're having a bad day and you suddenly feel sucked into that and you can't escape from that. That is not intimacy. We think of that as intimacy. We're having the same experience when, when all that is, is like some fusion, some emotional fusion that is destructive to intimacy. Because then there's not an other to connect to. You're trying to be the same person and you can get really resentful um, when they're not having a, a good day. And what a cruel thing to not let your partner or your family member have a bad day because now it means you have a bad day. And so they can never be upset. They can never be having a hard time. They can never be stressed out. They can never be short because that ruins your day. We have to develop a maturity and a sense of self and a grounding that we can allow those around us to be who they are. We can listen, we can hear, we can be with them while holding on to ourselves by being rooted in something deeper. Um, the other day, uh, Freddie and I had this, well, I had an intimate experience with Freddie and don't worry, it's not a weird story. Um, it's, uh, we, we I, I took Juniper, my, my, my kids, to the, to the, to the dock. We were, we were down at this dock. Um, and uh, Juniper, a two-year-old, was taking off her shoes. Um, and I told her, don't take off your shoes, you're going to get a splinter. About ten times I told her to not put her shoes off because you're going to get a splinter. And, um, and I showed her a splinter. And I said, do you see this? And she said, yes. And I said, do you want this to go into your foot? She said, no. And I said, put your shoes on. She took her shoes off again, and she got two giant splinters in her foot. And she screamed, and she moaned, and they were, they were like, they were much bigger than her foot. They were like this long. I mean, they're huge splinters, and she was crying, crying, crying. Um, and I, uh, I, I whisked her up, and, and I put her into the car, and I drove her home. Um, and Freddie was there, thank God. And, uh, like, I held her down while she pulled the splinter out of Juniper's foot with, a, with a, you know, a little safety pin and tweezers and all this. And, um... And, and she was wailing and crying, that Juniper was. Um, but she, it had to come out. There was kind of no way around it. Um, and I was so grateful she was doing it because she's steadier than me with this kind of thing. Um, and I felt so close to her. I felt like there was this intimacy. I felt like there was the connection. I don't know what she was feeling. It might not have been that way. But it doesn't need to be on the exact same page. There was um, a depth of, of connection and shared energy that I felt. Um, that I could bring myself into that with. An extreme need for your partner to feel exactly what you feel, to be happy, to be pleased, is ultimately about not having a deep-rooted self. It's about a reflected sense of self. It's about needing somebody to kind of to, to fill the gap that you feel. It's about that seventh grade kind of like, I gotta get a partner so bad so that I'm okay. I need somebody to fill the gap um, that is within me and that never seems to work. We see this in the concept of giving someone an orgasm. You know, that's the thing. Like, it, it, you know, you want to give somebody an orgasm as though it's something you can, here's an orgasm. Here you go. You have one of these. Um, I think a sexually and spiritually mature view of people is that um, somebody can have an orgasm. You can help, but it's not you that produces that. And that's our modern culture that thinks that it's about conquest. It's about, like, achieving this level of awesomeness that you can, you know, manipulate somebody into having an experience and that experience is between somebody's own brain and their own body and their own spirit it's not something that you do to somebody it's something that they have for themselves the best you can do is assist even married people who, who you think theoretically should feel very secure can act out of a need to to prove something our insecurity runs so deep but I think the heart of the gospel is freedom from crushing insecurity. And if you just did a double take of like, okay, he was just talking about orgasms and now the heart of the gospel, 
then I think that's because, and maybe you didn't, but um, that's because we have separated these two things so much. We think that like one is like, oh, and the other thing is like, oh, let's talk about that, but let's not talk about this. And we have to overcome these knee-jerk fears about talking about real things that we all think about and talk about all the time, but that we don't want to bring into the church, into the spiritual realm, into polite places. I think we need to talk about it in polite places, or it's all about that it's just a haircut. It's a meat market. Or it's a horribly scary secret thing that you should never ever talk about because there's something wrong with it. I think the work of Jesus is to break down the stigmas around these, these things that society says um, we should never talk about. The work of Jesus is to break down the hierarchies that perpetuate a belief that some people are great and some people are less worthy of love. I think good sex, good sexuality, healthy, mature, joyous, spiritual, creative sexuality doesn't come from a desperate attempt to fill a gap in our own self-image. It comes from passion, from communication, from creativity, and through ultimately a security with yourself and your partner, which means getting to know yourself and discovering who you are, which is pretty much the same journey as the spiritual journey with God, unmasking surrendering, letting go of all the posturing and the need to be something we think that we're supposed to be in order to get that love. That we are part of a tradition of grace, which is you already have that love. Stop trying so desperately to get it. Just receive it and let it change you. Thomas Merton, um, a great um, writer and, and a Trappist monk, wrote this, the pale flowers of the dogwood outside this window are saints. The little yellow flowers that nobody notices on the edge of the road are saints looking up into the face of God. The lake hidden among the hills are saints, and the sea too is a saint who praises God without interruption in her majestic dance. For me, to be a saint means to be myself. Therefore, the problem of sanctity and salvation is in fact the problem of finding out who I am and of discovering my true self. In the old stories of love making in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, the English translations say, um, instead of had sex, they say no. Ruth and Boaz knew each other, right? And Adam and Eve, they knew each other. And I always kind of read this as an English translation of somebody who was scared about talking about sex. But in fact, the, the word that's used there in the Hebrew um, is to know which does include but what no means in that culture isn't to have information about, at least this way of using it. It's to have a deep personal experience with, to have a profound connection to. The Hebrew word no is to experience deeply, which means to be with somebody while holding on to yourself. Now that can be sexual, but it can also be platonic, it can be personal, it can be divine to know God while holding on to yourself. So I want to teach you one, one last thing. Um, we, we talked about a different prayer prostor every uh, uh, service that we do this month as we talk about bodies. Um, and, and last week we, we talked about this posture, kind of open-handed, the re receiving the spirit. Um, and today I want to teach you this one, which is the, the hands on the heart. It doesn't matter which hand you want to put on your heart. But sometimes, um, I first uh, read about this, um, in Taoism, uh, kind of talking about Taoism. Um, and, uh, but I've, I've seen this in Christian texts as well and other traditions. And um, I've started to pray like this sometimes and I've started to sing like this sometimes. And, and the idea around praying like this is because you are connecting um, to your heart, to the center of love, to passion, to desire. And so um, I encourage you some time to try praying with your hands on your heart, to try singing with hands on your heart. Juniper, do you wanna put your hands on your heart like this? Want to do this? Oh, you don't. Okay. You just want to be with me. That's fine. Um, might as well try. Uh, our hands on our heart. Um, may we pray with love. May we overcome our shame, our fear, our distrust of the body. May we overcome the lie that we were made defective. May we celebrate the great spiritual, sexual, creative gifts of God. May we know and be known while cradled in the grace of God. Amen. Um, so now receive this benediction. May you have the trust to know that the creator did not make a mistake when you are made. 
May the spirit of God well up within you and take you on a journey from the head to the heart. May we become lost in grace. Amen.